In this video, I'll explain how secrets work in Kubernetes and I'll give you some production patterns as well. What is a Kubernetes secret? It's a Kubernetes object with the kind secret, which is designed to hold sensitive data. So I have my Kubernetes cluster here. And if I do K get secret, my secret, and then output that as YAML. And when I run this command, then I get the output of my secret object. So here you see, this is kind secret, and here is some secret data in here. So this data is stored as key value pairs, as you see here, password, blah, 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 username, blah, blah, blah. Now these values are base 64 encoded, but that does not mean that they are encrypted. This is very important. This data, although it might seem like gibberish to us humans, it's not actually encrypted. It's not actually secure. So if I run this command, echo my password and pipe that to base64, then what I get is a string of gibberish to us humans. This is base64 encoded. It's encoded, it's not encrypted. So this I can actually decode very easily. So if I do echo and then take that value and then pipe that to base64 with the flag D, then we see that I can decrypt this to my password very easily. So this is not secure at all. Yes, it protects me from when I'm sharing my screen and I'm, for example, showing a secret object. You should never do that, but say it happens. Okay, then at least the humans cannot just read it, but you can very easily get the information that is encoded in the secret. So it's obscured, but it's very easy, easily reversible. But real security relies on etcd encryption at rest. This is done in your cluster configuration or role-based access control. So I'll, I'll, get, I'll get into what that means a little bit later in the video. But let's just start with creating a simple secret. So to create a secret, you can use kubectl. kubectl create secret. And then the type of the secret is generic. There are several types like TLS certificates, but usually you'll use generic for just these kinds of key value pairs. The name is my secret. And then we pass from literal username admin and from literal password is secret. So this is actually the command that I ran to create the secret that's already here. K get secret, my secret. This is the command that's there. And I ran this command and this created the secret that we see here. So th this is one way of creating a secret. Another way is to use from file. So you can point this to a file, for example, config.json or SSH key, and then it's going to take the contents of that file and base64 encode that into a secret object. Now you can check the secrets by using kubectl get secrets, like we said, but if you want to see the contents of that secret, then you pass o yaml like this, and now we see the content of that secret. So let's see what the password is that's encoded here then. So if I do again, I will do echo and then take that value, pipe that to base64. D, and then we see it's secret, like this, just like we specified in the command over here, secret. Now, this is how you can create them with kubectl. The second approach to creating secrets is using YAML files. So with Kubernetes, you usually are not running kubectl commands directly. You're actually deploying things from code. So here's an example of a secret file. So if I go to my Kubernetes cluster, and if I do s.yaml like this and paste that in, then we have a secret object over here. Now I can apply this to my cluster. If I do k apply fs.yaml, then it has created my db secret. So if I do k get secret my db secret o yaml, then we see that we have this db pass and db user over here. So that is how you would deploy Kubernetes secrets from code. Now, obviously, this is not very secure because anyone who has access to this code 
can immediately get access to the values in there with base64 decoding. So there, there, there are ways of encoding this, which will be in the next section of the video. But for now, just remember that, yes, you can create secrets this way, but this is not secure. But for demonstration purposes, we're just going to keep it this way for now. So there are several ways you can actually make use of these secrets, or in other words, consuming the secrets in pods. One, the first way is consuming them as environment variables. So with this, you would pass the value from secret key ref or env from secret key ref to your pod manifest. So let's check out what that looks like. So I'm going to copy this pod manifest here. And if I do pod.yaml, paste that in. Now we have our pod manifest. So this has a container with the name my app container. It takes the busy box image, and then it's going to echo the environment variable that we are setting in. And the environment variable is configured as follows. We set an env object here, and then we create a list of environment variables. The first one is going to be app db user. And now the contents of that environment variable we are defining as follows. We say value from, and then we, we refer to a secret, which is the secret that we just created, the name my db secret. And then inside of that secret, there is a key called db user. And it's going to take that db user key and store that into the environment variable. So that is how that works. So if I deploy this pod, and if I check my pods now, here we see that we have one pod running. And if I check the logs of this, then we see that my username is admin. So it has successfully injected that secret into the container decoded it and now i'm able to access that from within my container so if i open up k9s and if i open a shell here and i press env then we see that this environment variable app db user has the contents of admin like this just like we configured now if i delete that pod and if i then open up my yaml again i can also do a different approach where I do an env from here. So env from is basically going to take everything that's in the secret, my db secret, and inject that as environment variables. So earlier we only had the db user key or the, the db user environment variable here, app db user. But now let's see what happens when I do it like this. So I close it, I apply the pod again. And let's check out the logs. So now it's not outputting the contents of the environment variable correctly because it has changed. Because if we do k get secret my db secret o yaml, we see that the the key is different. It's not the same environment variable that we are creating over here app db user, which is then used in the script over here. But if I enter the container. And if I do env, then we see that we have our db user um, environment variable set like this. And our db pass is now set like this. So we have both of our secrets available to us in environment variables. Now, you might be thinking, well, if you can describe the pod then, then you will actually see the, cont the, the contents, right? Well, let's check it out. If I k describe pod and then pipe that to vim, so I can easily scroll through it. Here we see that the environment variables, it has detected or it's describing that it has the, the environment variables from this secret. However, it's not printing out the contents of that secret in the description. So this is a safe way of handling secrets in your containers by injecting them as environment variables. And this is actually according to the 12 factor app. If you know what that is, this is a basically a standard that I always recommend that people learn, especially if you're a DevOps engineer. It's a set of practices, and one of them is that you define your config and your secrets in environment variables, and it's considered to be a secure way of doing it. Now, the second way how you can consume secrets into pods is using them as mounts. So let's check out how that works. Let's open up a 
pod.yaml again and paste that in. So now we have some now we have something different. Now we have a different command, but first let's take a look at these volumes. So here what I'm doing is I am mounting the secret with secret name mydb secret to a volume called secret storage. Then I define a volume mount object in my pod manifest, and here I'm saying you must take the secret storage volume that's defined over here, mount that in Etsy secrets, and then set that to read only because you don't want to be messing with secrets from within your container. So if I now delete the old pod again, and if I apply the new updated manifest, now we see that our pod is now being created. And now when I check the logs of that pod, we see that it has checking secrets and then it's outputting the DB pass and DB user. So what this command is doing is it's doing an LS of the Etsy secrets that we defined over here. So it's here showing the, the contents of the directory that we mount that we mounting over here. So because it is showing db pass and db user, we know that there are two files here called db pass and db user. So if I exec into the container again, and if I go to Etsy secrets, then we see that there are two files here. And if I cat them, then I can do db pass. I get the contents of the db pass file. And if I do cat db user, then I get the contents of the DB user file. And these files are then mapped to the secret object that we defined earlier, right? So this is the second way how you can consume secrets inside pods and how your applications can make use of them. So they can either pull the secrets from the environment, which I prefer according to the 12 factor app methodology, or you can read them from the disk as I just showed you. So this is how Kubernetes secret objects work. You can ha have sensitive values in secret objects and then consume them inside pods this way. But again, what I've showed you is not necessarily secure. It's more secure than having it in just plain text, but it's not secure. Base64 is not encryption. Anyone who can read the, the, who can read the secret object can also decode it. How you would limit this is, first of all, is you use role-based access control. So you use service accounts and users, and then you limit which users and service accounts can actually get access to those secrets. So cluster users should not have open, um, open field to all secrets, right? Like maybe their own namespace, but you don't want to have um, full access to all secrets over your entire cluster, for example, if you have multiple the uh, users in your cluster. Another thing is etcd encryption at rest. So by default, etcd, which is like the brain of your cluster, where everything is stored in key value pairs, by default, this is not configured to store it encrypted. And this is what you learn in the CKS exam, for example. I have this, I'm a kubesternaut. And one of the tasks here, it's a cluster admin task, is to learn how to encrypt etcd secrets at rest. So even though I might not have access to your namespace, if I'm a cluster administrator and I have access to etcd and it's not encrypted, then I can just easily read out all of the secret information from there. Now, there are of course a few limitations with if you are just using secret objects like this. So manual rotation is needed. So you would have to, if you change the secret, you would have to update the secret object and then restart your deployments. Your base64 is visible in the YAML and API responses, so you need role-based access control. And there is a potential sprawl across namespaces and cluster, right? If you're just creating secret objects everywhere, there's not really a central registry for these. Production patterns, so how, how this would work in actual deployments, is encrypting secrets in Git using H. And this is what, uh, what I teach in my Kubernetes Home Lab course. So the Kubernetes Home Lab course is a the course that comes after my fundamentals. This is an eight-hour course that's going to show you how to set up a Kubernetes Home Lab from scratch, but of using GitOps theory and going deep into security as well. And in this course, we are using the SOPS integration of Flux CD. So 
This course will, will teach you how to handle secrets from code so you can safely commit them. If you join today, you get access to 40 plus hours of more courses about becoming a DevOps engineer with a Kubernetes focus. You get access to a community of almost 600 DevOps engineers. We're all very active, like I'm, I'm active here every day. And if you have any questions, if you get stuck in your learning, you can ask me questions directly either through posts or by joining one of the Q&A calls. So I highly recommend you check that out. I think you might like it. The next pattern is the external secrets operator. So this is a controller that syncs secrets from external managers. So you can, for example, store your secrets in HashiCorp Vault, in Azure Key Vaults, in AWS Secrets Manager or GCP Secret Managers. And then you have your, let's say, Azure Key Vault, you store your secrets in there, and then the external secrets operator is going to pull those in and create the Kubernetes secret objects for you. So this is a very clean way of, of handling secrets. This is actually also what I do in my home lab. And why this is good is it, it has centralizes the management. So you have your single source of truth in your Azure Key Vault, for example. You can leverage the mature external secret stores and their features. So if I have my Azure Key Vault, then first of all, it's completely redundant. So I, I, I can be 100% sure that my secrets are never going to get lost. I can use Azure Key Vault secret rotation, so I can automatically rotate my secrets. And I can use auditing, so I can have certain standards for my secrets from there. And this really greatly improves your security posture. So. This is what I actually use in my own home lab as well. And what I recommend, uh, the SOPS way is an easy start to get, to wrap your mind around it. And then when you, uh, when you have learned that, then I recommend going to the external secrets operator and a full demo of this is out of scope for this beginner video, but this is the way forward in my opinion. And in KubeCraft, I also of course, share my complete setup for the external secrets operator like I did in my home lab. And lastly, if you're using managed Kubernetes services, for example, Azure Kubernetes service, then very often they will have integrations of for syncing your secrets from, for example, Azure Key Vaults into that Kubernetes cluster. So your cloud environment is very likely to offer some kind of secret rotation and syncing as well if it's a well-designed product. So there you have it. That's the introduction to Kubernetes secrets for beginners. If you want access to this file and want to read through it and get all of the commands, and if you want to, if you have more questions and want to get more information, make sure to jump in my, in my community, school.com slash and I hope to see you there. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next one.